Okay. Hello, everybody. It is 12 o'clock. Good afternoon. Welcome to this event, which is the future of high streets. I think it's obvious to say some of our high streets are thriving. Some of our high streets are struggling. Uh, but all of our high streets are changing and changing in quite significant uh, ways for influenced by a range of different um, factors, some of which we're going to, if not all of them, we're going to um, explore today. And I think the question is, in what way are they changing? Uh, what are those factors that are influencing them? And then what might we do about those factors to help places and high streets uh, do well in the future? I think is where we want to be uh, in the conversation today. And we've got a great panel to explore those issues. We've got Councillor Susan Hinchcliffe, who is the leader of Bradford City Council. We've got Deuce, uh, Dr Lucy Montague from Manchester University, Manchester Met University, and author of a brilliant book called Tales from the High Street. And we've got Andrew Cooper, Chief Executive of Leeds Business Improvement District and former chair of the BID Foundation. So the panelists to look at the macro and the micro, the general and the specific. Um, we're going to hear from them, from them very shortly. They'll set out their stall and then we'll get into a bit of a conversation. At the appropriate point, or indeed at any point, you can stick your thoughts or your questions in the Q&A function. I'll keep an eye on those and I'll field them to our panelists as appropriate and will be done by um, one o'clock. So that's how we're going to do it. But we, before we hear from our, our esteemed panellists, we've got a question for the audience. So if we can have our first poll question, uh, please, that will be fantastic. So you can see the poll question in front of you. What is the main challenge for high streets? Not enough money in people's pockets. Cost of being based on the high street is too high. Changing consumer habits, mix of uses on the high street. So I know you will probably want to take all of them, but we're not letting you do that because there's no fun in that. Uh, so we want you to pick the one that you think is the biggest challenge, uh, the most important challenge. And I, as I said, I recognize that all of them are challenges, but there'd be no fun if you just clicked all of them because we'd have all the names the same. So which one is the main one? I've waffled on, you've read the question. Uh, let's get the answer up. Our panelists can ignore uh, the answers immediately if they so choose, but I will come back to them. So we've got 11% uh, not enough money. Uh, we've got 32%, which is it's too expensive to be on the high street. We've got 30, no, 50% or 53% changing consumer habits. So we're not going to the high streets because we're doing more stuff on line as an example. And the uh, least uh, option or least important option is that the mix of uses on the high street is inappropriate, i.e. there are too many uh, shops. So I think that is interesting. I would not have predicted that, but maybe my panelists would have. So then we'll get to that in due, uh, in due process. So let's start. Lucy, let's come to you. Uh, you're the academic. You've done the study. You've written, literally written, uh, the book on our high streets. Give us the macro picture, and then we'll hear from Susan and Andrew about some of the specifics in different places. So paint the picture of what's going on in our high streets across uh, across the country. Sure, thanks, Andrew. We've been told countless times, haven't we, over the decades that the high street's dead, that's it, it's gone uh, first, but, but the reality is perhaps rather different. I mean, if you think about it, the high street has been in crisis multiple times, First of all, we had the arrival of supermarkets in the 1950s. Then we had uh, the move towards out of town shopping with policy changes, free market policies in the 80s. Then we had the arrival of clone towns with the spread of big chains up and down the country, leading to those homogenous high streets that we've become so accustomed to now, let's say the 90s. Then we had the financial crash of 2007, eight, all before we get to the current crisis, which could be traced back to maybe 2018. So really what that tells us is that the high street is an incredibly resilient place um, and something that evolves and changes over time. It's not something that has died in the past. And our research would suggest that it's not going to now either. As Andrew mentioned, uh, we've recently published a book, High Street, with my co-authors David Rudlin and Vicky Payne, which is the major output of a three-year study. 
what we did was look at 100 case studies up and down the country, both in terms of hard data, Experian Go data, pre and post COVID, just by coincidence, because we happened to straddle that period, but also speaking to the people in those places to understand the stories behind those different towns, cities, villages. Why are some places thriving? Why are some places struggling? And the important thing there is to understand exactly what's causing the current crisis uh, before we start administering the treatments. What we found is that it really varies from place to place, but in general, we would say business rates are a major, major issue. We need to incentivize independents who are agile and they're ready to fill the gaps often where we've seen the major, what we call multiple retailers, those big chains up and down the country fail. Lots of big names gone in the last few years. So putting less emphasis on those because previously they have been the big target and in fact what's driven rankings across towns and centres in terms of their retail offer. We need to tread carefully around permitted development rights, um, in particular the change of use from not just retail to com other commercial, but from commercial uses to residential in, in particular places, which has the threat of undermining the kind of retail offer and the resilience of place in the long term. And also really importantly, we need to think about much more strong, better, more positive planning policies around town centre first and halting out town development. If we get it right, the good news is we think that this really all points to a much more positive future for the high street, which could actually become much more diverse, much more community oriented, more resilient, more entrepreneurial in the long term. It means something probably with a greater mix of uses, people living there, more services and hospitality, a thriving evening economy, more public services, all of that sitting alongside an ongoing retail role for the most resilient of the multiples that we're left with who are battered but bruised but surviving and a really, really strong independent retail sector. That just needs really clear positive moves at a national policy level and support for local interventions. Brilliant. We'll come back to a lot of those sort of themes. I think that, you know, one of the things that we've talked about before as well, is you know, the, the balance between wanting change, encouraging change, but not just having any change, right? I mean, your point around, yes, we want some more residential in and around our high streets, in and around our town centres and city centres, but we need to be mindful about how that mixes in with the other uses and doesn't ultimately then become the thing that drives other uses out for a variety of uh, different uh, reasons. So I think there's something in that we definitely will definitely come back to that uh, and similarly get your thoughts on, um, you know, the role of business rates or the costs of being on the high street, how we might meet, need to think about that moving forward because of the way the different consumer habits that we now um, have. Right, Susan, uh, give us the view from Bradford in sort of sense as to what's happening, you know, how did some of these issues play out? What are some of the things that you're then thinking about doing in Bradford to kind of mitigate some of the downsides, but also maximise some of the upsides? So first of all, I think uh, the future of the high street is real. As Lucy said, there is a future for the high street. And I think any politician who ignores that is at their peril because it's a weather vane for how people think about their lives. Uh, and if you have a good thriving high street, they'll feel happier about where they live and, and saying they're proud of where they're from. So it's a very important political issue for us. Um, in Bradford, uh, we saw the change in retail coming a long time ago. So we've been planning for this a while ago. And I think some of the core cities might, they've, they've been insulated from the conversations we've been having because um, the, the top 100 retailers were in the core cities and nowhere else. Well, we've had to confront this uh, a few years ago. So we know that there is not going to be the need for that much retail space in future and all our high streets wherever they are in the country have relied very much on retail space but in the future it's going to be more about residential it's going to be more about leisure a bit of commercial very varied uses basically as alongside retail of course which will always be a staple of our high streets uh, and we have to as leaders have to try and curate if you like as much as possible what that high street's going to look like now that's not on our gift of course we don't own all the land we don't uh, populate the shops but as as a as a key influencer we we're trying to do that here in bradford so for example uh, here we're, we're knocking down one of our major high streets which is uh, old retail space that people don't want anymore and actually creating a new market 
Um, the market itself uh, is being moved from the top of town, right up a hill, uh, and we're bringing that uh, down to that new site, which is closer to our shopping centre. And they, when we knock down the markets, that will become a new community of a thousand houses, again, bringing people and living into the city centre more than it's ever been done before with mixed tenure, mixed uses uh, within that as well. And then leisure, of course, we've got uh, the NEC um, reopening a building that was closed for 40 years, which is a 4,000 seat to live music venue uh, and uh, ready for a city of culture, Bradford's going to be a city of culture in 2025, ready for that massive grand opening. Um, so we've got leisure investment going in there. We've got houses. Uh, we've got commercial office space. We've got a new office block going in, which um, when people think they don't need offices anymore. However, anybody with massive, massive estate of offices might not need that much space, but might want a smaller space and one floor in a smaller building. So the commercial office space is not dead. You know, it's still part of the mix. It's just how you curate that. Going back to your question, I would have been one who would have would have ticked actually cost of living crisis and money in people's pockets. Because the rich people are, I think there's a correlation between the richer the area, the more the the more populated the high street is. From places that are poorer, that actually people can't afford to shop, and therefore shops can't afford to stay there. So I think there is a direct correlation. But notwithstanding that, obviously the other items on that list were also influenced. And I, I'll leave it at that for further. Yeah, no, that's a good point. Well, I, just, just, just say a little bit about Susan about you know the, the sort of public reaction to you know the closure on the closure of stuff on the hill and the migration of stuff you know, down the hill into new stuff because everybody wants some new stuff but they don't necessarily also want the old stuff to stop. So what was what's your reflection or reaction on how the public engaged in that process and how they felt about the change that you were you know that you were then undertaking. So we're still engaging with them, I suppose, is a question. So that thousand houses, we're out to consultation, I think, in the next couple of weeks to say, what would you like this new community to look like? So involving them right from the beginning in that process. I think for us, the the OD, old Odeon building, which was um, redundant for 30, 40 years, bringing that back to life, getting NEC in there, who are going to run it as a 4,000 seat live music venue has been hugely significant for people in Bradford because it shows that our history can also be part of our future. Uh, and running that alongside some of the new things that are happening that people might be more uncertain of, I think shows that we have faith in that building and, and in everything that's gone on here in the past. And we are willing to refashion things, repurpose things for the future alongside the new. It's trying to keep yeah. the old and the new together. Uh, so that people still feel a sense of belonging to the place. Yeah, great, excellent. Well, I will come back and you can say a little bit more about you know how the the local authority thinks about what's going on. But and Andrew, uh, come in now. And just obviously, you're part of well, chief executive of the Leeds bid, but you're also part of the national bid uh, movement. And obviously, bids have a particular function, particular role, particular set of responsibilities. So just bring that to bear on some of the questions about how we think about the high street, what the factors are influencing. And then we'll get into a bit of a chat. Absolutely. So, so the the first thing was, what's the current state of the high street, and what are the challenges and the opportunities? And I look out the window to my right and see Leeds, and Leeds, like a, a like a, a lot of cities, have had challenges with their retail because it's uh, some big names have gone in recent years: Debenhams, Topshop, House of Fraser. Um, and if you go back a bit further, you'll have British Home Stores, and if you go back even further, you've got your. Uh, um, Woolworths and so on. So those gaps that have been left on our high street uh, need to be filled. And it's how quickly and nimbly uh, investors and the local authority can be enabling to make that happen. And I have to say, when I look on the high street of Leeds, and yes, I I'm paid to promote Leeds, but Leeds is doing that very well with its town centre first policy. When you look at our Debenhams, it's shrink wrapped in black uh, plastic vinyl, uh, which will be a brand new Flannels flagship store. And if you know the architecture of Leeds, uh, the, the old Debenham store is very sort of architecturally pleasing. So that, that sort of uh, retail space is being preserved and repurposed very quickly for spring next year. The top shop in the city, which sits on the parameters of our uh, Trinity shopping centre, which is 10 years old, but architecturally it's still as fresh as if, if it was born yesterday, uh, is going to host the new uh, sort of Zara store, flagship store in Leeds. So again, recalibrating and opening in the summer of 2024. And then a, a lot of big core cities that has been mentioned earlier has this big house of Fraser Hole. And 
and Leeds cracked on with it, worked with developers and with the planners and bulldozed it down. And, and architecturally, it wasn't that pleasing to the eye, so I don't think anyone's missed it. Uh, but what will be replaced is, again, retail with residential in, in, in our city, uh, city centre. So mixed use. Brigitte is our Oxford Street, and already we're seeing our high street being recalibrated nimbly, quickly by people working together. And, I, and I'd say that that's the challenge for a lot of high streets, as you talk about across the country, uh, what are the challenges that, that, that are faced, it's how quickly investors can work with local authorities to, to repurpose and to recalibrate and to get their centres going again and recognising that the old uh, models might not be the, the, the new ways. But what we're seeing in Leeds is a fully let Victoria Gate, which was opened in 2017. We're seeing low voids and low retail availability. And we're seeing a lot of new brands coming out of London and settling in Leeds for the first time. Brands like Flat Iron and Lounge and Nike and others. And, and so we're seeing positive economic impact. But that, but that is, I believe, because of the sort of collaboration that exists, the fact that we're quite a compact city, that we have a strong professional sector, which, mm. which makes the retail sector feed off. And yes, those areas uh, that are around our city centre, the donut part of, of, of Leeds, where there are areas of deprivation and areas where uh, people don't see the city centre as theirs, but, but they can, they're now making that connection because of the regeneration and redevelopment that is going on. So the challenges, I think, to summarise is for all high streets is to fill the gaps uh, and the opportunities is to do that collaborat collaboratively and not just have a high street full of vinyls. I think business improvement districts pay a catalytic part and uh, there are 17 in Yorkshire and Humber. There are 10 in West Yorkshire and Susan and I were chatting about that just before we came on the call. Um, there are th 335 business improvement districts in the UK, and next year will be the 20th anniversary of the regulations. Those business improvement districts contribute £150 million a year to our economy. So we know that because they're not political, because they're not for profit, because they are business led, they are well placed to help some of these changes that are happening on our high streets. Brilliant. Excellent. Very good. Thank you very much. I mean, we'll come back to that. To, to some of those issues, particularly the interplay between the bids and, say, local authorities and such. We can get you talking a little bit about that, and Susan can say something on that as well. Lucy, come back to you. Um, first off, you painted the kind of big picture on, you know, place, some places doing well. We think they're resilient over time. More play. Can you say a little bit more about, you know, maybe within the 100 or, you know, beyond that? Is there something about those that we know are able to do better, they're able to respond and adapt to change. And there's some of the underlying factors. We're already at a kind of questions about that. You know, both you said, you know, you said sort of very variation and independence help us recover, but do they also help places to be more resilient in the first instance? Is this really a story about bigger places versus smaller places? You know, does the hierarchy of high streets really matter? I mean, what's your take on that sort of big macro picture of performance? Yeah, I mean, of course, there are anomalies in all cases, because much as we've kind of heard from uh, Susan and Andrew, it, it does also come down to people and really progressive, confident, bold moves by local authorities, by bids, but also by retailers, entrepreneurs, local communities. But there are some general trends. Um, we did draw up what we called the Indie Index, which ranked places, the whole 100 high streets, uh, according to how many uh, independent retailers they had versus multiples. And generally, it was true that the more independence they had, the more resilient they had been. Um, so part of the challenge here is to really think about how we uh, support existing independents and small businesses, but also how we incentivize new ones. That can be a range of well-known sort of things from small grants, fit to for fit outs, um, reusing fitting pop-up shops but also more inventive things like the council taking on the lease because often landlords are very reluctant to let to independence who they see as a high liability um, and then the council can sublet you know but I think it's important to mention that independents aren't more resilient than multiples um, in fact you know we saw far greater job losses there but there are lots of independents and there is always another one willing to give it a go where one fails. So it is part of the answer is looking at how we support independents. The other trends, though, and this is something that Susan alluded to, is that interestingly, you might have thought that major cities were the ones that were insulated from the current crisis. And that just really hasn't been the case. 
the ones that have struggled the most in terms of the evidence are in fact the smaller cities and the large towns. Villages, uh, small towns have done quite well because they've really had a much more unique offer usually in terms of their retail, more of a mix. And they've also benefited from that move towards work from home trend, which has increased massively, obviously, during COVID and stuck with us to some extent, whereas major cities have really felt the impact of those workers not being there during the week in the same way to service their businesses and their retail and food and beverage offer. So that tallied with the major multiples that existed in the big cities has meant that they've been hit really hard. And in some cases, actually, small cities and large towns have been much more resilient. Yeah, no, that's a great point. I mean, exactly. The, the, the factors are varied. And then the, the, the mixture of the factors in any one place is also varied. You know, it's a sort of uh, complicated thing on that. Um, Susan, come, come back in. I mean, Andrew talked a little bit about you know, filling gaps, as it were, and thinking about the mixes. You know, Lucy talked about some worries, for example, about wanting change, encouraging change, but not having any change. So there's a degree to which that can be, you know, curated, that can be managed, that you know, that can be ordered or organised. You know, how how does that feature in the in the in the way that you are approaching how you deal with some of the challenges in in Bradford? That you know, wanting change, encouraging new uses in, but also be mindful about the mix ultimately. So that you know gives you the best chance of recovery. Just just say a little bit more about that, Susan. Yeah, I mean, some of it we can't control. A lot of it we can't control, of course. So we don't control the cost of living crisis. Um, I, I'd like government to understand more about how high streets work as well, because um, I think you know the permitted development stuff that you alluded to earlier it can be very damaging. Actually, I mean, they can change a shop into a, a residential property. Um, but they, they, they therefore have to have any permission about bin storage or anything like that, and they can just have bins out on the pavement. You know, that's that's the problem I think all local authorities are facing at the moment. The controls we have through planning are, are really quite useful, and if we, we're not able to exercise those, then it doesn't allow us to curate our space. Um, so I think um, we, we need some understanding that changing high streets takes a long time. Um, and actually, they're always going to be in flux because our lives are in flux. So just so we want something now doesn't mean 30, 40 years time, it's still be the, what is required, which is why involving young people, actually, in the design of our high street is really useful. Um, you know, 15-year-olds can work AI and chat GPT. How's that going to affect the high streets? We need to really talking about those with young people as to what their future looks like so we can actually sort of future-proof some of our high streets as well. Because the changes we're making now actually probably needed doing 40, 50 years ago, but it takes a long time to get them done. Yeah. Um, because, you know, a local authority is not in sole charge of its place. Yeah. Um, so it does require local authorities to get stuck in and to use their power resources to um, change the face of that high street. But given, obviously, local authority finances at the moment, that's going to be restricted in future years. And, and that's going to be a shame because it might mean that local authorities take more of a back seat than they have done in, in recent years. Yeah, that's a very good point. We'll, we'll definitely come back to, to the, the limits on what local authorities can do, both from a powers point of view, but also from a resources point of view. Get your thoughts on that. Andrew, come in on this because you talked about, you know, filling gaps. You're looking out the window. You can see quite a lot of change happening. A lot of that is taking place in the kind of market space in terms of, you know, pri private demand, you know, changing as such. But just talk a little bit about how that relates then to, you know, what the, the overall view or perspective is for, you know, for the city centre and how some of that is created and managed rather than just the first occupier or the next next occupier. How do we find the right the right balance between those two things? Yeah, I think it's right. It's about uh, thinking about the use within the city centre. And, and, and Susan's right, we've got to think about uh, the future and who's who's going to be the future users of our city centre and what might be right now, I agree, might not be right in the future, particularly when, uh, while I would agree that there is some underutilised above store space for residential, uh, turning all our high streets into residential is, is dangerous because we potentially remove the heart of our communities and the place where people gather. Um, and so I, I strongly believe uh, that, that it requires all parties to come together. And I mean, no, no, that's not a political thing, that's just a general thing, but in, investors, uh, retail brands, independents, residential, to, to curate how they want to see their high street look in the future. And it's only through true collaboration that some of these changes can take place. 
And uh, in, just just as an aside, we just mentioned in young people, and, and young people are really important. And someone said to me the other day, Andrew, there's a there's a lot of people, young people, gathering after school on our high street, which is which is Brigitte. And I said, yeah, that's a good thing because they feel it a safe place. They think it's that, yeah, but they, they, they're causing a bit of nuisance. Yeah, they might be, as we all did when we left school uh, at uh, four o'clock in whatever age we lived in. Um, but they feel that their, the high street is theirs and they feel safe in that space, maybe because of the brands that they associate with around them, but they're, they're, the city centre is their safe space. And I, I saw that slightly differently, particularly in a post-pandemic world where parents might be working at home or they might not feel welcome at home, or, or, but their, their city centre space is there. So I think we have a responsibility to create, curate a, a city centre that is for everyone. And um, and as I say, that, that comes through me, through collaboration and working together and not relying on one organisation to achieve that on its own. Yeah, no, that's a good, very good point. Uh, and, and can be challenging in a sense because it, in some respects it's the same space. I mean, how do you manage... You know, different uses within the same space, often at the same time, is is always an ongoing uh, ongoing challenge in, in in that respect, definitely. And I, I think as well the, the 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 notion now of a city centre, you've got a daytime use and an evening use. No, it, it all merges a little bit now, and and in terms of people's changing behaviours, so you've got to think about the entirety of how your city centre is used uh, through all hours of the day, and some of the crossovers of sectors and communities and demographics means you get a different mix and what you want is a vibrant city centre, not one that has tumbleweed after four o'clock. Yeah, absolutely right. Um, Lucy, come back. You talked a little bit about, you know, doing the work. It wasn't intended, but you sort of started uh, before COVID. You did during COVID and, you know, you're publishing sort of hopefully after after COVID or post COVID or whatever it is we call it now. Um, quite a couple of questions on did you see during the sort of process, have you seen noticeable change in the way that people are using their high streets pre and post you know there's this kind of couple of questions on do we see people using them as local hubs you know going there to work in co-working space whereas maybe before they went into their you know into their uh, main office is that the kind of thing we seem to have seen you know a bigger recovery on weekends on a kind of consumption entertainment basis than we have necessarily in the in the, the working week. I mean, how would you frame sort of COVID particular re related trends, Lucy? I mean, what, what, what would you say on that? Mm, I think I suppose the big surprise there is that it actually didn't really change anything for the high street. The, the patterns that we see now are patterns that existed before COVID hit. It accelerated some of them, definitely, but some things have started to level out. For example, the impact of online retailing, obviously this was climbing it was climbing before covid um it spiked massively when we hit that first lockdown for obvious reasons all non-essential retail was forced to close but it's dropping and it's continued to drop um and it we think it will probably stabilize around a quarter of all retail sales um so it hasn't had the big devastating impact actually and it was very interesting to see in the poll that people thought that was the big issue and i think you know we've been told that a lot in the media and the headlines that online is the big threat it's not statistically it's not it's um and in fact there's a lot of examples now of <clears throat> where retailers are using it very successfully in a sort of hybrid form what we call omni-channel retailing um where they have a physical store and also an online presence either their own website or using amazon ebay etsy discogs there are lots of independents as well as for big multiples to have that online presence they get a halo effect where they have a physical store, they get greater online traffic and sales as well. So it's really actually, ironically, perhaps, possibly not only not the death of the high street, but could be a savior because it gives even independents access to a much wider market, a much wider audience. They're not entirely reliant on footfall through their door. So online is not the big baddie, I suppose, that we thought it was going to be. And it hasn't had a, a lasting impact from the increase over COVID. The other thing, though, that we saw, which you might expect to be related to COVID, is there was already a trend towards experiences rather than stuff. So people are moving towards um, going out for coffee, a meal, those sorts of things on the high street, rather than going in to buy more things in shops. That started before. 
it, it continued to increase, of course, arguably because once people once lockdown was lifted, people really wanted to get back out there having those physical experiences. So that is the biggest sector that's seeing the most exponential increase across high streets is that food and beverage sector, whilst most others continue to drop. Brilliant. So, I mean, that, that experience sort of angle, you know, you, we, we do hear much more of that. Susan, obviously you talked about the, you know, the, the music venue being a critical bit of the, you know, the, the future jigsaw, as it were, of Bradford. Is, is, that, is that reflecting on, you know, the desire for people to be out experiencing stuff, not just necessarily buying stuff or consuming stuff in, in shops? Is that part of the thinking in, in Bradford? Yeah, I mean, you can't over rely on it like you shouldn't over rely on retail. You know, it needs to be part of a whole package. But for us, uh, having the 4,000 seat live music venue, Bratford Live is what we're going to call it. But the markets as also all that we're doing as well in Dallas Street Market, that has also got an outdoor entertainment space with it, with a big screen up, because we recognise that that food and leisure thing needs mixing. It's not just about going in shopping, coming out again. It's about the whole experience. They call it about shop attainment, don't they? Are they still talking about that, Andrew? I think they probably are. That it, When people come into a city centre, it needs to be something which is entertainment, uh, which has got shopping incorporated in it, but it's a leisure pursuit now. Uh, and we need to make it attractive for people to be there. So we, we're trying to include leisure and uh, enjoyment and entertainment wherever you go we, with high high quality street public realm, of course, as well. We have, one, we have City Park here with the fountains, which is a, a major space for us uh, right outside City Hall, which is where I am now. <laughs> uh, and that is an iconic image for us as a city now, uh, which projects our, our might as a place all across the world. So the city centre is our shop window uh, and how you present it is really significant for the whole economy and how our brand as a place is perceived. Yeah, I'm happy to share my my personal bias as I've never felt shopping has been entertainment, but that's entirely down to me and nothing to do with the experiences that wonderful places like Bradford and Leeds and others offer. It's you know simply a reflection on uh, the strange uh, person that I uh, am anyway. Andrew, coming on, on this sort of, you know, finding the balance between, you know, not just the classic retail offer that, you know, that we often associate with days of yore, but actually, and how are you deliberately trying to make that happen in somewhere like Leeds? What can we learn from how Leeds has gone down that approach? And obviously, you've got a question, a live question about some of your markets. They are covered, some of your markets in Leeds, but what's the future of them? They need to adapt. They're a pivotal part of the, of the future as well, but they will need some adaptation. Yeah, there's uh, eight eight shopping centres in Leeds, including the, the the indoor market, and the and the market is biggest in Europe. It is very vibrant. It is a a, a bed for uh, startups as well, where uh, in terms of a test bed, uh, there's opportunities in there to to for for young independents to give give it a go and to see if they can progress from a market stall to a high street shop. So I think that's really important in a place, um, and I think in terms of interventions in terms of keeping yes you can't just rely on retail as, as has been said but retail has changed in terms of its experience and hopefully we'll get you there Andrew it'll be, it'll be great uh, but it's that experience it's other things around it your evening economy your, ca your cafes your entertainment and it's projecting the whole offer and that it is available to everyone and part of the of the work of business improvement districts across the country is having that place-based intervention rather than being identical places that you just get, as was mentioned earlier, play to the strengths of your the place that you're in. And that's why there are place managers, bid managers, place leaders working together uh, to make the best offer for, 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 for the place in which you serve. And that's what business improvement districts are all about. I think some of the challenges are uh, in that collaboration is what's been mentioned earlier is the squeeze on some of the local authority finances and public finances, which means sometimes there is a, or well, there's a bid, they're going to fund the gap. And obviously that's not what bids were set up for. They uh, The statutory obligations on the one hand, additionality of the bids on the other. And I truly believe that when there are these crises, 
and, and there are sort of people saying, right, how are we going to repurpose our high street? It is that collaboration that says, right, how are we going to make this new market work? Or what about this Christmas intervention that we're going to do to bring people in? Or, or there's a safety issue in the city centre. And these place-based interventions mean that our towns and cities remain as they should be, which is clean, safe and friendly and attractive and people want to, to, to come there. So I, th I do believe there's an onus on everybody uh, to be part of the discussion and not just, as I said earlier, one person or one organisation. But bids can be that glue yeah. to make some of that change happen uh, because they are have no agenda other than the place in which they serve. Yeah. OK, I, I completely agree with that. So um, let's talk a little bit about, so we've talked about some of the changing, the patterns, the trends, what we're trying to achieve, what we need to achieve. Let, let's look at some of the obstacles that are there and then what we might do about them. Lisa, come to you first, because you started with or talked about um, business rates, you know, the co crudely the cost of being on the the high street, which, you know, which... 30%, you know, or just over 32% of the poll said, you know, they felt that was a big issue. Just say a little bit about, A, the problem, which, you know, is varied and long and difficult and complex, et cetera, but what we might do about it in order for it to be a less of an obstacle as we move forward to help this adaptation. Get other thoughts on that, but then Susan, maybe talk a little bit about local government finance and resources, et cetera. So Lucy, just say a little bit about business rates. Mm. Um, well, I mean... It's probably not what any of us want to hear, but the reality is that business rates are fundamentally flawed as a system. They um, and, and reality as well is that they can quite easily undermine all of the excellent efforts that are made at a local level to reinvigorate a high street. They're exceptionally high, basically, and unsustainably high for a lot of retailers. And that counts for independence as well as the big multiples. It's been cited as the reason that some um, businesses that we spoke to in our case studies couldn't be saved, including big department stores, because in one case, for example, it was 10 times their rent on their shops. Um, so this is clearly a big problem. The two specific issues with business rates model is one, they're based, of course, on the property valuation, but the property valuation is always out of date. So it's there's a lag in the system. But also they're disproportionately penalise physical retailers, so retailers on the high street, over online retailers who pay a much, much lower proportion of their uh, turnover in, in tax, essentially. So that is not helping if what we're trying to do is maintain a local economy with a high street, et cetera, et cetera. What's needed, of course, is an entirely different system, basically. Um, but that isn't something that's been very forthcoming. Uh, Conservatives have said they will probably review it. Labour has promised to completely reform it. It was quite a big focus at the party conferences, especially for Labour recently. Um, obviously, there's been the autumn statement that's come out since the conferences as well, which has frozen the rate for small businesses, for small retailers, hasn't helped the major retailers at all. It's it's a bit of a mess, really. So we need to we need wholesale reform of that system. That's the first that's the first thing we need. That's the that's the big thing that we need, right? I mean, in a, it's like it's a, it, you're right. I mean, I don't disagree with any of your analysis. Is a big big problem. I mean, it's compounded by, as you know, uh, it provides a lot of tax revenue for the government, which is relatively stable because of the way it's structured. It's also its use is often then funneled almost immediately back into local government because it's used as one of the mechanisms to fund local authorities up and down the country through complicated uh, means. Susan, come in on the, you say anything you want to say on business rates, but then just talk a little bit more generally about some of the problems now about local government resources. You know, we're getting, you know, we can see more and more of that in the everyday uh, press and what, what that means and what we might try and do something about that. So um, I, I think the business rate stuff is even bigger a problem, actually, than just alluded to, because I think it links to rents, doesn't it? And rental property, rental prices of property have been high for many years, probably over high, actually. Um, and that that's the two things are linked. Uh, and therefore, the issue around high streets is primarily a property and land one. Uh, and until we try and grapple with that, it's going to be very difficult to move high streets quickly. Um, because it essentially vested interests of land and property owners who have bought land at a certain value and need to maintain it at a certain value. Otherwise, they're going to have to write it down. And that is 
a lot of that property could be linked to our pensions, for example. So you'd be writing down pension pots. So there's a whole linkage here to the property industry, uh, which is when when I've talked to them before in previous existences, you know, they didn't really want to tackle because obviously this is actually uh, undermining their whole industry and the principles on which it works. And uh, that we, we need to grapple with that somehow, and that's not easy. So I'll leave that for Andrew and Lucy to do. <laughs> <laughs> but you want to, okay, well, I'll, I'll bring them back in on that. But say a little bit about, you know, just the, the squeeze on local government funding. Yes, I don't wish and, with and the how, how that then implicates and has um, implications for what you do. So obviously, autumn statement wasn't good for local authorities. Uh, it wasn't just there wasn't anything in there for us. There was an actual cut in there for local authorities on top of 13 years of cuts. So uh, it is going to get increasingly difficult for local authorities to do things because obviously social care is taking up all our money now. So... But I'm somebody who never says no to things instead of, you know, we can't is not an, a, a question that I really like hearing. So we have to think about how we do do things. And that is, again, losing soft power, influencing. It's about working with private sector partners. Uh, the English Cities Fund, for example, are leading on our 1,000 unit houses at the top of town. That's not the council doing that, it's working with those partners using different vehicles to get things done. Um, so UK Investment Bank, you know, is some different models they can have. So we're going to have to have different models of how public sector can uh, be supported to invest in its places. And in, in an economy which is not growing, that is hard to do. So, but there needs to be some grown-up conversations about what financial vehicles are out there for us to be able to sustain the change that we need to. Because otherwise, you know, every high street is going to fall behind and UK citizens won't tolerate that. No, no, I agree with that. I completely agree with that. And you, and you again, you raised some interesting questions about, you know, the role of property owners and landlords and particularly in places that are, you know, maybe struggling a bit more where the incentive is actually to sit on the asset rather than to reuse the asset, which is, makes sense from a from their perspective, but not from a public perspective where we actually want to bring those assets and uses back into use in some shape or form and how do we do that i think is a is an interesting kind of question maybe you know maybe lucy some of the case studies offer some insights as to how you get meanwhile or interim or occasional uses into into some of those assets even while they stay as they are andrew come in on this you know the, the general cost of doing business on the high street how does where does that fare for you you know you're kind of your, your uh, bid members, are they worried about that? You know, do we want to say, obviously they'd like to see reductions, but. Yeah, de definitely business rates. E every government comes in and says it's going to review it and it never gets reviewed. And obviously business improvement district is based on the business rates model. So one will affect the other. Just coming back on to property owners for a minute, and then I'll come on to a few other points. Um, it would be really great it, it, as a country if we had a database of property owners. Some of the challenges within our city centres, we don't know who owns the building. Just to get an eye bolt in to put some Christmas lights up or a hanging basket or something quite simple, we don't know who owns the building. And it can be left there, as you said, for some time and uh, no action is taken. And I think what we're seeing if we're talking about levelling up, well, let's level up with property owner bids. We have property owner bids in London where landlords actively engage with their business improvement districts. Uh, so it's not just the tenant that pays, but the landlords pay. Let's have that uh, further uh, north as well uh, so we can actually engage with property owners and get a sense of what is best, best for a place. Um, in terms of uh, um, developments as well, you say, uh, you know, an empty property that might be there and it can the you know compulsory purchase make something happen but when something does happen with a place uh, sometimes property owners don't communicate it you, you know just by putting something outside the property to let people know what the future is going to look like and when it's going to finish it actually goes a long way to the motivation of customers who are coming into that sense of place and i think that is something that should be enshrined in law a little bit rather than uh, leaving places uh, void and empty and then you don't know what's going on behind the scenes because often there is something happening but it isn't communicated up front as i said i think business rates and the costs on the high street uh, business rates does does need a reform I, I think in terms of uh, business improvement districts, uh, they've been around for 20 years and the regulations uh, are now well established, but haven't been reviewed uh, despite several uh, successive governments promising that. They started in 2003 
under the Blair government and then started in 2004 officially. So next year sees our 20th anniversary. So an opportunity, I think, to look at those regulations and see how they can help in some of the challenges uh, that face us on our high streets, in our town centres and in our places across the country. Yes, there's some mechanics in there in terms of making sure there's better engagement with people. Uh, but in terms of uh, whatever government gets in, there's clearly a model that is there that can be helped to re-energise and recalibrate our high streets. And, uh, and, and they have cross-party support. So I would hope that the government gives some attention to business improvement districts uh, in, in the future. Yeah, brilliant. Lucy, come back in on this. You talked about of business rates. Now we've had sort of questions about property ownership. Did you know? Did that play? How did that play out in your you know in your case study analysis? You know, was there anything? Te- were, you, were you able to discern anything around ownership and what that then meant for the for the high streets that were doing well or not doing well? Was it more transparent? Were they more active or or didn't? Was that factor not really uh, present in, in some of the, in the case studies you were looking at? I think it's it's a wholesale problem, really. Um, I think to, to really start to tackle a high street um, at a national or a local level, you've got to understand the retail development model and the financial systems at play there. Um, there's two things in particular that have been alluded to. One is this tying of capital valuation to the likelihood of something being relet. Uh, so essentially, the valuation of that property um, it needs to be maintained for shareholders. It's particularly a problem in malls, actually. So the owners or the asset managers are much more reluctant to drop the rent and therefore refill that property, which is what you'd expect if it's lying empty, you drop the rent. They don't want to do that because it's going to directly decimate their capital valuation. So they don't do that. The other thing that's happened in terms of um, property um, development models is that asset stripping has been what's polished off quite a lot of those big names that we were used to having on the high street, even the department stores. That's where um, big names that we've had, you know, legacy retailers have been sold and uh, they had their, their stores, which they owned outright, were then uh, either sold separately and, re- and then released back to the business or they were remortgaged, leaving them in a very, very vulnerable place financially, unable to reinvest in their infrastructure, unable to weather the storms of an economic downturn. So that has tipped them over the edge, basically, when they've been around for sometimes hundreds of years. So those things have been at play. The the good news, I suppose, if we're to look at solutions in terms of retail development models, is that there are three things we've seen happening in our case studies that are possible ways forward. One is that we have a new breed of retail developer. At the moment, there are a few examples of this, and we hope that we're going to see more. We could look at Bobby's in Bournemouth, for example, where an individual uh, developer, very entrepreneurial, very creative, has taken over that big infrastructure, used one floor as uh, an art space, but then subdivided everything else into smaller spaces that can be let to independents by being very flexible, very responsive to his tenants and keeping his capital costs low because the good, other good thing is that you can now buy this retail space for much, much, much less than you could build new. He's able to form a viable um, development model there. So we could see more of that. Uh, the other role possibly is for councils to be more active. So we've seen, for example, in Stockport, um, councils taking on empty units themselves, subletting them, their big problem of the big empty Debenhams they've solved, maybe, hopefully, by thinking about relocating that out of town Stepping Hill Hospital to that site, selling the out of town site for housing development. So killing two birds with one stone there. And of course, you get then get the benefit of footfall, increased footfall in your town centre from having a hospital that's in the centre. The other option is, as we've spoken about a bit already, a mix of use. Some of the best schemes that have survived are things that um, fortunately didn't get through before some of the crises. And so where they were retail heavy to begin with, they've now been rethought as a much more mix of offices, retail, leisure uh, and residential. And that is a way forward as well. Yeah, really. Susan, come in on that because you talked a little bit about, um, you know, providing space and opportunities for, for office use or, you know, that kind of, you know, the office is not dead, people will need to come in. You know, all the work that we've done shows us a relationship between the extent to which our cities and town centres are hubs of office activity and then how that feeds into a range of other activities, whether it's retail, hospitality, entertainment, whatever, and actually some of our more successful places, 
you know, tend to have small amounts of retail relative to other uses, but it all does really well. Leeds is a kind of relatively good example of, of that alongside others. But j- j- again, that sort of future around Bradford's city centre being a, a hub for office related or uh, commercial activity, which then has benefits for a range of uh, other things as well. Yeah, it's part of the answer, isn't it, for us? I say we're not... We're not putting all our eggs in one basket in Bradford. We are trying to get a variety of uses to make us resilient for the future. I think the trick, just having offices there themselves is not good enough because you you need to make sure that there's a good passage of activity through to the evening economy as well. If you close your offices at five and then things don't open until seven, you've got two two hours there with nothing to do and people will just go home. So you've got to think, as Andrew said earlier, you've got to think about every hour of the day. How are you actually making sure that people have a reason to dwell in that place comfortably, safely and productively? Uh, And you you just need to think about how you can manage that time all through the day and night. And we're not there yet. I mean, obviously, we've got lots of work to do, but these are the kind of conversations we're having about how we sustain people for longer in the city centre. And town centres, in fact, we don't just have Bradford t- a city centre. We also have Bingley, Shipley, Ilkley, Keighley town centres, and and the, fortunately we have three bids in Bradford this year, which I'm really proud of. Uh, and they're also having these conversations about how to make sure people stay for longer in their towns and city centres. And some of that is markets, some of that is events, um, and and some of that is just making sure shops are open for longer. Uh, yeah. and, but that does need a bid really to get them all together to have the same agreement about longer opening hours. Yeah. And c- come in on, on, on that in a general sense, but also I'm interested in, you know, how you, as the bid and then the, the city said to think about particularly bringing more residents in back into or into our town and city centre, which is a good thing, but, but it needs to be managed carefully, right? Because in some respects, their needs and what they want from the place will be slightly different from those that consume it or as visitors or, you know, occasional. So just say a little bit about uh, about that as well, how you've gone about managing some of that, bringing some of those residents back in or people back in to live. And then what? What? how do you manage that so it's not a kind of ne- negative experience for them? Absolutely right. The, the key thing is that the residents are the best ambassadors for your place. And if you don't engage with them and they, if they don't feel that their town or city centre is for them, then you're losing one of the most important um clients or customers who are going to say, um, you know, good things about the, about your about your city centre, about your town. So it's, it's vital that they're engaged. And, and in Leeds, uh, population circa 800,000 now, what we've done is to make sure our projects, um, uh, particularly our events in the city centre, are free, uh, particularly across summer and school holiday periods. Uh, we'll even include Bradford holiday periods as well to make sure people can come across from Bradford. Um, but to make sure that we have free events in the city centre, that they feel uh, not constrained by some of the cost of, of living that we've just been discussing, uh, but they feel that their city centre is there. So whether it's putting animatronic dinosaurs in the city centre to create a free summer event, and working with our Child Friendly Leads uh, initiative uh, and working with schools, uh, uh, to bring uh, maybe parents who can't afford to take their kids on summer holidays to bring them into the city centre to experience some of that free activities really are important. So getting that engagement is is key. Uh, I, I would say for any place, you sort of look at your strengths and then think, right, what events can we do? And it's not always about starting at the money and go, well, I ain't got the money, so we won't do anything. Sometimes a small street market, a Sunday market or a, an artisan market can be the start of something that gives a place an identity or something that's particular to your to, to your place or your city. So our strategy has been using the bid, working with partner organisations to make sure we don't duplicate and tread on each other's toes. So if, if um, uh, Madonna's at the arena, well, it's best not to put something on that weekend. So let's work together. To, to make sure that uh, you you can work, uh, 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 you know, have a nice experience within the city centre, uh, but making sure that the different organisations are putting a mix 
of activities and events on that drives footfall into the city center, which then obviously supports shops, cafes, and all the other businesses. And going back to the other point about the office sector, really important because a lot of them commute in and see Leeds as their sort of place of work. That has increased in Leeds from about 39% to about 44% now. So that, that sector has grown. And because we're quite a compact city center, we're not surrounded by uh, retail parks and so on because of the planning policy here has been excellent in making sure we protect our city center that means that we have that core and multiple use and i think that's it's a, it's a good model brilliant um i give i'm going to give the final word to, to lucy in a second but susan i can't believe we've done 50 well 50 nearly 55 minutes and you haven't mentioned the bradford city of culture uh, in the not too distant future which i you know you're slipping is all I'm saying, but I'm going to give you that chance to just connect that and how you think about that and how that sort of supports some of the, the kind of the things that we've been talking about, which is actually creating a vibrant, dynamic sort of program of activity that celebrates the place, brings people out to, you know, to interact with each other. So, you know, away you go. So I did mention my opening comments just to... Uh, but I, I, didn't, I missed that. In that I, case, I didn't I want to over it because I talk about it a lot. <laughs> um, but just before, I was going to say as well that Bradford actually is a very beautiful <coughs> city. So we have lots and lots of listed buildings here, sandstone, gorgeous buildings, which actually, um, because they're all listed, is not easy to adapt them as well. So I think there is a bit of a challenge, therefore, between heritage and new uses and new high streets. But um, that's probably a conversation for a, another workshop. Um, so, yes, obviously, being city of culture is a tremendous. And it's the whole district of the city of culture as well. So our towns, as well as our city, is going to be really benefiting from it. Uh, and for us, it's 1.1 million visitors. It's over a thousand events. Uh, it's bringing people from all po all points of the globe, really, to Bradford to really see what we have to offer culturally and also bring other artists here as well. So it is a huge opportunity and we are seeing a lot of regeneration benefits already and positive decisions for us uh, because of City of Culture. Uh, it's an opportunity for us to get people to come here and see the Bradford through their own eyes, see the work we've done here in recent years uh, and want to come back for more. And it's also, I think, going back to my conversation about, you know, being, uh, how sure it's been emotional and about how people feel about their place. It's a chance for our people of Bradford District to feel proud of who they are and where they're from and their history and their future. Uh, and for me, that's that's a huge benefit actually from being City of Culture. But you're all very welcome to come, even before 2025. Uh, but you'll be all very welcome in Bradford. I'll we'll definitely take you up on uh, on that offer, Lucy. Kind of final thoughts for you, as far as you know, where you think we are now with the debate. You know, you talked the the book is out. You know, these issues have been discussed. Like confidence of of progress, you know, um, or not. And if either way, why why that why that case? Right. Well, the million dollar question, eh? Yeah. I think we are cautiously optimistic. But the bottom line is a lot hangs on national policy to support people that are working at a local level. So in turn, then a lot hangs on the next general election and the moves that are made in the run up to that and following that. It's very, very, very likely that we have far too much retail space in the UK, savage because you know it's probably predicated on reletting to other uh, retailers when in fact we might be looking at reletting to things that aren't retail but it definitely won't be evenly distributed across the country. So it's going to be devastating for a lot of places. And the key is to think about what can be done at a local level. The key is to think about what can be done to diversify away from retail because we need less of it. Not everywhere is going to have a hospital. They can relocate into the center, but I would encourage places to think about what they do have. No council offices, leisure facilities, anything that's out of town that has public use that could be in town, do that. You can simultaneously also achieve progress towards your objective in terms of active travel generating footfall and being flexible as has come up a lot over time because cities are always in a state of flux they're never finished sadly and the inevitable thing is there will be more crises to come so we have to set up to be able to change towards that new vision yes very good and good point to um to finish on the work is never done uh, and also um, apart from losing very final comments we got through uh uh, nearly an hour without talking about the general election, which I think is good. And we've definitely got through nearly an hour 
without talking about parking, which I think is also amazing. And well done to everybody on the panel. And indeed, even in the questions, no one actually mentioned parking. Somebody asked about public transport, but not about parking. So well done to everybody around around that. Oh, I know there are some good answers because uh, I've heard certain panelists answer questions on parking uh, in previous uh, sessions that we have uh, done. But anyway, uh, enough from uh, me. Uh, just to finish by saying thank you to Lucy, to Andrew and to Susan. That's been a really lively debate. The, as we said, we've done quite a lot on high streets. We will continue to do lots on high streets. Uh, they are never done and there's always plenty um, to say. Uh, so keep an eye on that. And um, thank you all for attending. Uh, but for now, Take care and stay safe. Thank you, Andrew. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Cheers. Take Bye care. now.